our next speaker, Brian Odegaard, uh, who is giving a talk on using web-based experiments to support transparent and reproducible research. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction. Let's see if my screen comes up shortly. There we are. Um, I'm going to expand the slides so they're as large as possible, which means that this display is going to vanish. So if something goes wrong, please feel free to chime in over the microphone and interrupt me. Uh, and I'll, I'll exit out and we'll try to fix whatever the problem is. So let's get this started. Okay, um, so as you just heard, I'm Brian Odegaard, and together with Sarab Ranjan, Addison Sands, and Konstantina Sokratus, the four of us form the senior part of the Perception, Attention, and Consciousness Lab here at the University of Florida. So we are a research group that uses behavioral experiments and neuroimaging and computational modeling to study sensory and cognitive processing with the ultimate goal of trying to figure out how those processes lead to conscious experience. Now, I launched this research group just this last year, and I had many ambitious goals for what I thought that year would involve. And then COVID-19 hit. Um, so uh, as I'm sure many of you have experienced, there have been a number of personal and professional challenges that we've all faced over the last nine months. But probably the most drastic professional challenge that I faced was the fact that our laboratory had to close down in mid-March. So we were conducting behavioral experiments in the lab, we were setting things up, we were collecting data, we were very excited. And then when the restrictions hit, we had to close all of that down. So when late March hit of this past year, I was actually reminded of a Simpsons episode from when I was a kid, where Homer is very despondent because his favorite bar has closed. And in this episode, Lisa tries to give Homer a pep talk. And she says, Dad, do you know that the Chinese use the same word for crisis as they do for opportunity? And Homer jumps up from the couch and he says, yes, Christ-a-tunity. And I thought that word really summarizes my mentality at the end of this past March. We had a crisis in that we couldn't conduct the work that we thought we were going to be able to do, but we had an opportunity to devote our time and our effort and our resources towards other things. And our solution to Christ Attunity 2020 was to invest more time in creating web-based behavioral experiments. And we did this by utilizing a JavaScript library that is specialized for creating behavioral experiments in web browsers. The name of that library is JS Psych, and it's the creation of Josh DeLiu at Vassar. And what I want to do in this talk today is describe three different things in our work towards this project. The first thing I'm gonna tell you about is the training protocol I put in place for my laboratory for people that are new to coding. So if you have an interest in conducting behavioral research on the web, but you don't have a lot of coding experience, I'll walk you through the steps that new people in my lab go through to cultivate this skill. The second thing that I'll show you today is I'm gonna share a template or tutorial with you for taking any task you've created in JavaScript and launching it online. So you can store data, get a unique URL, a link that people can click to do the task, um, as well as automate compensation for completion. And then the final thing I'll talk about at the end of the talk is simply how these web-based experiments can further some of the goals of the open science movement. I think research on the web is actually very well suited to accomplish certain goals of the open science movement, and we'll talk about those right at the end. So let's jump into it and first discuss the training protocol that I have for people that are new to coding. Now I've run an experiment over the last seven months and that experiment has involved taking on eight students who have no previous coding experience. So eight of the people on this slide are actually UF psychology majors who wanted to do research but didn't have a computer science background. The one ringer in this group is in the top left corner. His name is Gray Johnson, and he's actually a computer science major here at UF. And he's been assisting me in helping um, these eight other students learn how to code. Um, so when people have joined my lab, I walk them through five different steps to help them build this skill to create their reproducible research on the web. So what I'll do now is I'll just walk through the five steps that people create, and we'll look a little bit at the skills that they're building at each one of these five things. So first, when people join my laboratory, I first have them download a source code or a text editor to get started, um, something like Atom or Visual Studio Code or Text Wrangler, and then I have them dive into two JS Psych 
tutorials to start working in JavaScript. So the code that I'm showing on this slide simply allows them to get their feet wet in how to reference files in JavaScript, how to work with variables in that programming language, how to initialize the timeline to launch their task, and we look at what different parts of the code are doing and how they're doing it to show things in a web browser. The second thing that I have my students do is I immediately have them set up a GitHub account. Um, as I'm sure you've probably heard across many talks today, version control is extremely important when you're creating code to run different experiments. So I have my students watch YouTube videos from a YouTuber called The Coding Train, and then they set up their account. And what this enables them to do as they're using this new skill is to share solutions that they found with one another in links that they can provide to one another's code as they're cultivating this. So GitHub is an integral part of what we do in my laboratory. Then what I do is I sit down with each student and we talk about their research interests and we specify one experiment idea for the work that they want to do and we identify one stimulus presentation goal that they can work on in JavaScript. So this takes on a different form for each student. Um, Annalise, who's shown in the top row here, was very interested in a phenomenon called iconic memory. So the presentation goal that we had to solve for her uh, particular project was how do you show text on a screen very briefly and then record an open-ended response for how many letters people can memorize from that text. Sam, who's shown in the middle row, wanted to investigate audiovisual integration. So for her, we had to figure out how to show videos in web browsers and then record keyboard responses. And finally, Mason at the bottom row was really interested in this illusion called the ugly celebrity illusion. You can YouTube that if you want to, it's, it's really interesting. But he had to figure out how to show photographs on a screen and then record subjective ratings of facial appearance. So in my experience, if you give students one specific stimulus presentation goal that they can work on in JavaScript, they can start to figure out the nuances of the coding language as they work towards that presentation goal. The environment in which they do this actually utilizes Google Chrome, and the tool that we use in my laboratory that helps them figure out what's going wrong is called developer tools. So if you look at those uh, three little dots in your Google Chrome web browser up in the upper right hand side, if you click on that and you open developer tools, you can open this tool called the console. And the console actually gives you a running log of what the web page is doing as it's performing uh, different tasks. So here's an example of what the console looks like when something works. So here is um, Sam's project in my lab. She was able to show a video and then put buttons on the screen that people could click and it's going very well. Where developer tools comes in most handy though is when things don't work, when you have to debug your code and figure out what's going wrong. So here is an early prototype of Annalise's task where she was trying to figure out how to show a grid of different text on the screen. And you can see that errors pop up when things aren't going well, whether your program can't find certain files or whether there's a syntax error on a certain line. So we found this is a really good environment to help people learn how to write code that can show things in the way that they want um, on the web. Now, for more complex stimuli that we've started developing for experiments, we have to go a little bit above and beyond what that environment can do for us. So for some projects, we use a tool called CodePen, where you can actually work on your stimuli as they dynamically update. So the example I'm showing here is from a research assistant I had whose name is Siva when I was at UCLA, and he created what's called a random dot kinematogram, where these dots that are shown on the screen, some of them actually move in random directions and a small percentage all move in a coherent direction. So it's this really complex stimulus that has a lot of intricate parts. And I just wanted to show this off because we published this article in the Journal of Open Research Software. And it's a great example of how you can try to take an undergraduate, help them cultivate this skill, and then share open code and share the development process as well with others. Now, I almost feel a little bit bad showing this example because maybe watching this progression of slides has you feeling the way I feel when I come across books that try to teach you how to draw. Maybe this just looked like when you're looking at drawing diagrams and they say you can you know, make a circle, make a circle, draw a tail, and suddenly just add some small details and you have a horse. Like I, I don't wanna give that impression that my undergraduates go from like drawing circles on the screen in JavaScript to creating an RDK. That was a very long 
process, but it does give you a feel for the tools that we use um, and the sequence of events that have led people to success for even the creation of very complex things. So once that's all in order, I had them flesh out their experiment timeline in JavaScript using another tutorial through JS Psych, and then they have a working prototype of their task. So once they've done those five things, we have a file uh, using JavaScript that we can launch on the web. Now to do that, we actually have a specific template that we use for getting things up and running online to conduct this research. So I wanted to share that template with all of you in the next section. And what I want to highlight are three problems that it solves. Now, I've launched web-based studies at two different places I've been, at UCLA now and here at the University of Florida. And at both of these places, there are three things that I found very difficult to figure out when trying to do this work. The first is how you get a unique URL that people can click to do your task. The second is figuring out a way to store people's data from the web. And the third is trying to automate granting credit or compensation for when people finish your task. And what I want to provide you all with today is a template that we've created that solves all of your needs. And let me actually rephrase that. A template that Gray Johnson has created that solves all of your needs. So I'm giving Gray a halo on this slide because he's been fantastic as an undergrad and he's put a lot of effort into the template. I won't walk you through all of it today, but I'll just show you how it solves these three problems and why I think this is a great tool for you to use. So first, um, this template and tutorial up on GitHub is able to produce a unique URL for your study using Google's web um, API. So if you have a Google Drive account, you can actually take your JavaScript code and use this tool through um, Google Drive to create the link that people can click to complete your task. And Gray shows you how to do this in this tutorial. The second problem it solves is actually storing all of the data that people provide for your task. I was struggling with this this past summer trying to figure out how to set up an SQL database that I could link to my web-based studies. And in June, Ryan Mears, who's a colleague of mine in the UF psychology department, pointed me towards a tutorial from a guy by the name of Shashi Kant, who's at IIT in India. And Shashi, in his tutorial, showed how to integrate Google spreadsheets with Google's web API. So when we saw Shashi's creation, what we've actually done is we've taken it and we've run with it by adding a few features that I think behavioral scientists will really like. We implement trial by trial data saving, we implement unique subjects IDs to anonymize the data and make sure that you can extract it uniquely for each subject, and there's a few other features that I think social scientists and psychologists will like that we've added in. So we've also solved this, the data storage problem. And finally, we've automated granting credit in our studies. Now, we use the SONA system here at the University of Florida for um, people participating in research for credit. And I realize that not everyone may use SONA for their online studies. So I'm gonna provide my email here at the bottom in case there are other platforms that you would like us to add to this template to automate granting credit or compensation. We have plans to add Prolific to this template in January, but um, I'm sure there are other things that some of you use, and we're happy to be in a dialogue as we add functionality to what we've created. So we have a template and a tool that we can use. We've conducted behavioral work on the web this last semester. I wanna conclude this talk by just touching on some of the ways that this work can further the goals of the open science movement. The first thing that I think this does when you integrate web-based research with GitHub is it increases the transparency of the methods that you implement in your task. Going back to that famous science paper from five years ago talking about the reproducibility of psychological science, one of the issues that they identified was many times there's insufficient specification of the conditions that are necessary to reproduce what someone did. So when you take the task that's implemented in a web browser and you link to the code on GitHub, then people can look at all the different parameters that factor into what it is that you've created and what you're doing in that specific task. Related to that, it also allows for an ease of replication where so far, knock on wood, we've had really good luck with these tasks and their generalizability to different computers and different browsers. From Google Chrome to Firefox to Safari, we really haven't run into many issues with what we've created so far. And that's a good thing for being able to uh, facilitate other researchers using the tasks that we're developing. Um, I can tell you right now, 
I have other research that utilizes MATLAB and having just invested a month of my life into figuring out a MATLAB specific issue that wasn't playing well with a Mac security update, it's really nice when things are written in languages or utilize software that's generalizable across platforms and computers. And here, this is one way that it really is uh, pretty easy to replicate what we've done. And finally, um, and I'm sure this is something that's been talked about in the conference so far, we know that a lot of the behavioral work that we've done, at least in psychology, is based on samples that aren't representative of the societal and cultural diversity that exists around the globe. So many behavioral studies are based on what are called weird samples, or samples that are predominantly Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Um, and so if we want to find ways to increase the diversity in our samples and find samples that are more representative of, of communities around the globe, web-based research is one way to do that. Yes, you are limited because you're limiting yourself to people that have internet access, but I think it's a step in the right direction. So just to summarize where we've been in the last 15 minutes, I walked you through training protocol that I've developed for taking undergrads from no coding experience to coding. Uh, we're sharing a template with you today that I think can help you launch your own studies through JS Psych and JavaScript on the web. Uh, shout out again to Shashi Kant and Josh DeLiu for their creations that we're building upon. And finally, uh, I discussed a little bit about how this online experimental work can support some of the best research practices that we've identified in the open science movement. Finally, I just wanna say we welcome feedback on this template. It's a work in progress and I'm sure it will continue to grow and I want to give a shout out to those nine fantastic undergraduate students in my laboratory here at UF. These undergrads have run 500 subjects through six different studies during this fall semester. So when I envisioned where we would be in December of this year, when I started this experiment in June, uh, we've exceeded all of my expectations. And the nine of you are all rock stars. It's, it's been great working with you. Um, here are the references for my talk. And I just want to open it up now for uh, questions that you might have. There's a couple other links that I'll put in the doc that's linked to this conference. So you don't have to take screenshots rapidly as I'm walking through my slides here. And let me exit out of screen sharing so I can talk with anyone who's interested. All right, thank you very much. Um, I definitely appreciate uh, the, the creation of more tools and templates for this kind of like experimental setup. I actually started my uh, research in psychology before switching over. Um, so oh, very familiar with uh, <laughs> MATLAB psychophysics toolbox and, and things like that. It's good. One of the, I, I would like to find ways to bring the precision of psych toolbox to the web. So Josh has run some quality checks on what JS psych mm. does. And in terms of timing, it's actually very comparable to like PTB and MATLAB. Um, but there are still some other things that like PTB can do that um, take a bit more work to get up and running in JavaScript in terms of how you can control specific um, like frame by frame presentations. That's a little bit more difficult to do on the web, but it's still possible. So we have a, we have a question. Um, do you let students work on any subject they're interested in or do you encourage them to work on anything specific? Are there any subjects that work particularly well? I think there are a lot of cognitive tasks that lend themselves well to the web. Um, so things that relate to um, simple sensory processes and cognitive processing, that's good. I, I can tell you right now, I do have expertise in psychophysics. So in investigating um, very systematically how changing stimulus intensity or duration increases our confidence in what we see or um, our response time and how quickly we respond to things. So what I've been looking to develop are sensory tasks that are a little bit more complex than what you might think we should do on the web. So I actually have some, I have some hidden slides in this talk of if you wanna do vision science on the web, what are the controls that you can put in place to try to do experimental research that you would normally think can only be done in very well-defined rigid behavioral setups in the laboratory. So uh, like I said, my, my lab specializes in both sensory and cognitive things. And I'm really looking to increase the number of tools and the complexity of the tools that we can use for sensory research. Because if we can start controlling for things like um, where you're looking on the screen and how far you are from the screen and like pixel size, then we can actually start asking um, very interesting perceptual questions in those samples that I was talking about, you know, more representative samples and getting a much larger group of subjects than we usually get in psychophysics research. And I think we're getting to 430. 
Um, so I will remind everyone um, that uh, coming up next are the lightning talk sessions. So we will have, again, concurrent sessions with uh, one session in building one and another session in building two. And we will be putting links uh, in the chat uh, for everyone to be able to navigate around. Um, and if you're curious about which lightning talks are in which session, uh, I think you will also can find that in the agenda, uh, which we will link as well. Uh, so thank you very much again to all of our speakers. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera and mic off um, so that you have access to those links in the lobby.